Hi, my name is Jeff Coltenbeck. I'm a pet nutrition consultant and I'm excited about the decision you've made in purchasing this DVD and joining me on our journey to improving our pet's life. I've been blessed with many opportunities over the past decade or so, collaborating with pet owners to improve their pet's quality of life. From poor behavior to skin problems, joint issues, liver and kidney issues, even cancer and diabetes, I help owners to naturally and effectively support their dog's health through species appropriate nutrition, natural supplements, and holistic pet care. Although I'm not a veterinarian, I often have great success in dealing with client complaints. I do not diagnose, prescribe, treat, or prevent illness, nor am I licensed to practice medicine anywhere in the world. I simply educate owners that there are options to conventional therapies. This DVD will introduce to you such natural alternatives. You will hear from actual owners and veterinarians, not paid actors, first-hand accounts of how natural therapies can assist your pet achieve health. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy this DVD. I know you and your pet will benefit from it. Did you ever ask yourself if what you're feeding your pet is the best? Did you ever ask yourself, am I doing the absolute best for my pet? Why don't you follow me and we'll discuss some do's and don'ts for our pets. Food is always the number one topic of discussion when it comes to our pet's health. Unfortunately, pet professionals, particularly veterinarians, don't spend nearly enough time talking about nutrition and how much of an impact it plays on our pet's health. In addition to that, we are told to pump all sorts of chemicals into our dogs on sometimes a monthly basis, if not monthly, at least annually. And looking at dogs as direct descendants of the wolf, as many professionals and scientists believe, we really need to take a closer look at what we should be doing for our dogs. Feed them a species appropriate diet. We need high quality protein sources. We need highly available sources of fat. We need these sources to also be uh, good suppliers of vitamins and minerals. And that's how you wind up with a healthy animal. Feed them what nature intended them to eat, not what, not what the big industry has dictated to us. When it comes to nutrition, you might go to some pet shops and see a lot of dry food and kibble. Um, some of it looks good. Um, these are probably two of the more natural looking kibbles that you'll see. But you see the ones that look like cereal with artificial food coloring, uh, all sorts of chemical preservatives. Um, it just it doesn't look appetizing for a carnivore. However, you look at the fancy bags and the pictures of meat and fruits and vegetables, how could we resist? We're, we're brainwashed by million dollar advertising budgets and quite frankly by the guidance of our veterinarians telling us what to feed. Unfortunately, some of that information is false. I have no way else of saying that other than we could be doing a lot better for our animals other than what we're told. And if we look at commercial pet food, it's about 70 years old. Up until I think 1926, maybe a little earlier, there was no such thing as dog food. told that in the past 70 years our canine companions have evolved into omnivores. I am not a scientist, I certainly don't pretend to be, but it took the gray wolf of today to evolve over a 3,000 year period from its ancestors. So we're led to believe that in only 70 years our dogs have evolved into a creature completely different that is supposed to eat grain-based diets. It, it is scientific fact that uh, dogs do not have a requirement for carbohydrate. And if we look at commercial pet food, it's all grain. 60%, sometimes up to 80% of pet foods are grain-based. Very little meat. On top of that, they're extruded. And if you're not sure what the extrusion process is, extrusion is a food is sent through a machine at high heat, sometimes up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, it's cooked and formed into pretty shapes and sizes, and then they add some artificial coloring, so we think that we're giving our dogs fruits and vegetables. And then it's sprayed with restaurant grease or some kind of fat to make it palatable to our dogs. 
and we serve it in our plate and we're happy and enthusiastic because we think we're doing the best for our dogs. And I was in that position not too long ago. As recently as seven or eight years ago, I was feeding my dogs uh, a supposedly scientific diet and I won't name any specific names. And I thought I was doing the best for my animals. And then I learned better. But it took a long time for me to realize, and I've had pets my whole life, and it took until seven or eight years ago to start treating them better, uh, and what a difference it made. Uh, and again, you see these foods here, okay? These are grain-based foods. There's very little meat in here. Uh, carnivores, sh can they survive on this? Sure. They could also survive on this, okay? This is cereal. This is just generic cereal I picked up at the supermarket. There's nothing special about this. My dogs can survive on this. If I gave them this and a multivitamin, they'd probably live about nine or ten years. The bottom line, if you're going to use a, a kibble, get something high quality. Um, don't be locked into the holistic, all natural, uh, or even organic, especially organic, because uh, they're mostly grains. And again, we have no requirement for carbohydrates. Uh, so why would I make his diet consist of 70% of something he has no requirement for? That means he's getting 30% of what he is required. How is he supposed to be healthy? How is he supposed to live a long time? It's not possible. Are there dogs that do? Yes, absolutely. But George Burns smoked five cigars every day, too. That doesn't mean we should all go and smoke five cigars every day. And along the way, I'd be pumping them with chemicals, giving them their annual vaccines like I'm told to, um, throwing pesticides on their body to keep fleas and ticks off them, uh, and according to statistics, half of my dogs would die of cancer by the time they're eight years old. Grain is a very important thing to try to avoid, especially wheat and corn and soybeans, because they have been shown to contribute to the demise of the immune system, and also um, they seem to, I, I don't know if I would use the word cause, uh, cancer, but they contribute to an animal allowing cancer to happen. That is rather alarming. Okay, we're told that our dogs are supposed to live to 10 or 12 years old. I have clients who feed and rear naturally. Their dogs are living to 15, 16 years old. Yet we're brainwashed into believing that if we get 11, 12 years out of our golden retriever, then we should be thankful. I have clients, they have golden retrievers that are 15, 16 years old. And with the exception of arthritis, which happens to anyone who's that age, um, these dogs are relatively healthy and, and thriving. Uh, it's, it should not be the way it is today. I mean, it's almost an of epidemic proportion that our animals are faced with poor nutrition uh, and worse advice. The good thing about this whole thing is that people are starting to realize there's a better way. Okay, we shouldn't have had to wait this long, but that's exactly what it took. And now it's up to us as pet owners. Now, our dogs can't speak for themselves, okay? They look to us for leadership and direction. Having a dog is a huge responsibility, and it's up to us, the intelligent humans, to live up to that responsibility and do what's necessary for our, for our amazing um, dog relatives. It's time for us to speak out for them, not only with food. When we go to the vet, we need to take charge of vet visits. It's our dog. It's our money. It's our visit. You question every single step, and you question every single medication, you know, and if the answer is not to your liking, you ask again why, and if it's still not to your liking, you go somewhere else. We need to rely on veterinarians. They are skilled and they're some of the brightest men and women in the country and they can offer excellent medical advice but when it comes to nutrition particularly when we are recommended to feed substandard foods generally these are foods found in large superstores large chain stores um, supermarkets sometimes even the the cost savings clubs now are getting into the food business and I'm not saying the foods they're selling are bad that's not what I'm saying what I'm saying is is I went to these places and I couldn't find the food that I would feed my dogs okay now some of the foods there they may be good I don't know I looked and I searched I could not find a food that I would feed my dog in these places and unfortunately 
some pet professionals are suggesting that these foods that I wouldn't feed to my dogs are adequate nutrition. And this adequate nutrition is based on a very simple statement called complete and balanced. Okay? Complete and balanced is yet another huge myth in the pet industry. So we're told that if we place a bowl of food down on the floor for one meal, it's complete and balanced. Complete and balanced is determined by an organization called AFCO. They are the overseeing authority on pet food. And a feeding trial for AFCO to determine a food to be complete and balanced is approximately 26 weeks. And the 26-week feeding trial, I believe it has to be a minimum of 12 dogs. And these dogs have to eat the recommended foods for the 26-week period. And I believe four of them are allowed to lose weight. Okay, so basically, eight of the 12 dogs have to maintain weight over a 26-week period. 26 weeks. That's a half a year. So over the course of a half a year, I'm supposed to believe that a food is complete and balanced. Unfortunately, in the uh, dog uh, nutrition field, we use the terms balanced and, and complete. And unfortunately, there's really no balanced and complete diet. Um, I think we all understand that, that it's a jargon that we use to uh, try to sell dog foods. It's a wonder that the epidemic our dogs are facing with their nutrition it didn't happen sooner. And you can ask any veterinarian the skin and coat problems that they are seeing on a daily basis. Some of the most common we see is um, skin, skin and ear disorders, um, allergies being the most common thing, it's especially this time of year, um, between the food allergies and the environmental allergens. And then also obesity is a huge issue that we have. It's noted that there's at least 50 to 60 percent of all pets that veterinarians are seeing now have some degree of obesity and need some sort of weight management. All because of food is determined to be complete and balanced. And where did this all start? It started with cow feed back in the early 1900s, believe it or not. They saw such a huge profitability in feeding cows processed feed and they decided to transition this to the pet food industry. And what a wonderful decision it was because people have made billions and billions of dollars. And we continue to feed our dogs this substandard food. In addition to that, we contribute to their breakdown by pumping them with chemicals year after year. Okay, pet food conglomerates, pharmaceutical companies, they're happy. They're as happy as can be. As long as our dogs keep eating and keep getting injected and pumped with chemicals and keep having ill health, they will be rich. The good thing for us pet owners is that there is a better way. There's usually something you can do nutritionally and that you can do holistically that complements that animal's health. And hopefully this DVD is going to open up some doors for you. At least open your mind to the possibilities. Your, the best place for you to start is your local retailer. Go to your local independent retailer. Small businesses are the backbone of America. You're going to find intelligent, trustworthy, knowledgeable people, not 17-year-old children who are looking for a part-time job. Okay, you're going to usually find people who really care and they're going to speak from knowledge and experience. So now that we learned what not to feed, we're going to discuss what is appropriate to feed, in my opinion. Uh, and you'll see here on the table I have uh, quite a few foods laid out. Um, I have some raw meat. Uh, I have some pasteurized food here, which we'll get to in a minute. I have some canned food and some high quality kibble, uh, in addition to some supplements um, to my left over here. And uh, you know, we'll get to those in a minute. Um, you know, and what I've done over the years, uh, I've researched, I've studied, uh, trial and error, uh, you name it, I've been through it over the past six years. Um, primarily feeding my own dogs, uh, of which there's been eight dogs I've been feeding for the past six years, in addition to hundreds, maybe into the thousands of clients that I've assisted over the years uh, with nutrition. Um, and let me qualify too, because I don't, I don't want people to think that I'm coming across holier than now, that this is it and this is the way it's always been as far as I'm concerned, uh, because it's not that way. I used to feed commercial pet food. 
Uh, I used to be the person on the other side of this DVD. Uh, I was looking for answers and this is where my journey led me. Uh, pretty much what you see on this table is where my journey led me. Um, you know, and both my wife and I over the years have constantly strived to do the best possible thing for our pets, whether it was nutrition or vet care or exercise or grooming, we're always trying to do the best possible thing for our pets. Um, ultimately we found that there's a better way and this is where we come to. Uh, and um, you know, our dogs have been eating uh, primarily raw meat for, um, I, I want to say about six years now. Um, yeah, since 2002, um, we started getting them on high quality uh, natural foods, real natural foods. I'm not talking about processed natural foods. Once the food is cooked and formed into a kibble, in my opinion, that is not natural. Uh, natural is um, an uncooked product or a fresh prepared product. One of our biggest uh, turning points in natural rearing came with our 14-year-old uh, Shih Tzu at the time, Lola. Uh, she was diagnosed with Cushing's, uh, cancer, um, she had uh, cataracts and severe arthritis and um, we opted not to perform the surgery due to her age and the high risk of the anesthesia. Um, this being said, our vet, who a um, very compassionate person, uh, truly remarkable woman, uh, was very, very good and, and detailed about everything she informed us about, but uh, she gave Lola three months to live. And this is where all the science, all the studies, all the reading went out the window because my wife and I, we saw more than three months in Lola's eyes. And uh, I, I didn't need science and I didn't need a veterinarian and I need any experts in the entire world to tell me that my dog had more than three months to live. Uh, at that time, our other dogs, our pit bulls, were already eating raw meat and thriving uh, because of Lola's age and uh, because of her condition. We were reluctant, uh, and so when people come to me with reluctance, I can identify because I've been there. Um, I'm not talking uh, out of the blue, I'm talking directly from experience. And as soon as we heard she had three months to live, the next day we switched her to raw. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about detoxification later, but Lola had started to go through her detoxification phase, and uh, it was her road to recovery. And to make a long story short, um, Lola passed away in our living room at 18 years of age. That's pretty amazing. If, if, if we all knew that we could have our dogs living a third longer, and certainly a lot healthier because their bodies are communicating better with themselves, then we'll go for it. And it's not that expensive. So she didn't just live four additional years. Uh, there were four good years. You know, to see a 14-year-old dog who had three months to live, have her cataracts brightened up, her arthritis went away, uh, not completely. I mean, she had her moments, but uh, she was spry as a puppy, chasing our pit bulls around. Um, we always called her the, uh, the queen of the pit bulls. <laughs> uh, and uh, she, was, she was truly uh, a stepping stone, um, not just for us, but for a lot of my clients who had elderly dogs and they were reluctant to switch and I tell Lola's story all the time and uh, sure enough it, it is inspiring and um, if you knew Lola who was rescued off the street of the Bronx uh, when she was about three years old running around with a pack of pit bulls, rottweilers and German shepherds she fit right in here and she pretty much bossed everyone around so uh, I, my wife and I uh, are truly blessed that you know she was a part of our lives um, I, uh, I mean that wholeheartedly. So that's Lola's story and I, I hope, I really hope it's inspiring to, to people who are out there looking for answers uh, because our dogs are family members. Uh, they are part of, of our pack, you know, and uh, my dogs, they, they get us through a lot in life. You know, life is not always, uh, you know, peaches and cream. So um, our dogs are certainly worth any effort that we could provide to them. It's always, it's cliche-ish, but everybody feels that their pets are their children and they're members of the family. So let's get back to the food because that's what you know, we're really talking about here. That's, you know, that's what Lola benefited from was the change in diet. You know, my other dogs had already benefited from it. So um, as far as foods go, um, 
and you know, there's there's uh, some excerpts and some uh, literature on the DVD that you can use uh, for your computer, and uh, recommended links to websites and suggested readings. So you're not only listening to me, but you're also doing your own research, and you can find what works for you. Um, you know, and that's it's all provided uh, to you. Uh, as far as uh, food rankings go, um, first and foremost, I always recommend raw. Uh, I believe. Um, not just through my research and my studying and you know certificate programs that I went through um, first-hand account uh, I see daily on numerous types of dogs and even cats uh, and obviously through my own experience with my own animals uh, raw is the absolute best way to go so I start if I had to rank food I start number one is raw food uh, number two if you can't do raw there's products out there that are slightly cooked um, and they're referred to as pasteurized diets uh, and you can see here uh, this is a type of pasteurized food it has the consistency of a bologna the pasteurization process uh, food is cooked at about 180 degrees for 10 minutes so it's not terribly denatured it's also fortified with vitamins and minerals so uh, if raw isn't for someone this is certainly an option uh, for everyone to go to if they are concerned about raw and we'll get into concerns with raw diets and bacteria in a few minutes but um, if they were concerned this is certainly a good way to start I mean it's very easy to work with uh, you could break it apart you know uh, my dogs love it Jake out good boy here you go pal you want some of that that's a good boy huh who loves you that's a good bubs huh okay go ahead that's my 10 year old pit that's Jake um, we'll get to him in a minute because uh, he is um, a 10-year-old dog that you wouldn't think was 10 years old. Uh, okay, so getting back to the food, pasteurized is what, or, or any slightly cooked food or home-prepared meal, I would have a, a second ranking to raw. Um, you know, and if you want to look what, to see what some raw meats uh, do look like, this is just a, a, a ground beef uh, concoction. Um, you know, and it's, uh, it's a very fatty meat, uh, which I prefer for my dogs, uh, because animal fat is their lifeblood that's where they derive most of their energy they do not derive energy from carbohydrates um, although that's what popular opinion uh, and I stress popular opinion dictates um, dogs can utilize carbohydrates but their primary source of energy is animal fat the dog eats first and foremost for energy um, <clears throat> the uh, prime uh, primary source of energy uh, for dogs is, is fat the second source of energy uh, is protein Raw foods on the market today, they come in a variety, like the ground meat. They come in patties here. Um, you know, it doesn't get much simpler than what we have available to us today. Uh, years ago, uh, raw feeders, they had to do a lot of preparing on their own, uh, which could be time consuming. Now, it's so simple, it's so convenient. Uh, and, you know, if you have a large dog, you could opt for patties. If you have a smaller dog, we have little tiny one ounce medallions here. Some foods, uh, and this is not, um, uh, cat segments, but some foods are interchangeable. And they can be fed to dogs or cats, provided there's enough taurine there to support cats. Uh, but there's a, a variety of raw foods available to us. So between the raw and the pasteurized, you can do your animals a great service uh, by starting to, to to go down that road a little bit and, and investigate what's available to us. Um, and uh, we're going to be preparing a meal in a few minutes, uh, and I'll go through some supplements as well. Um, but uh, getting back to the ranking, so we have, we have number one raw, we have number two pasteurized or home prepared. Many pet owners are opting for home prepared meals nowadays. Greg Cleva, a canine behavioral therapist with Barkbusters, and his wife Maria are such owners. So Maria and I use a very simple recipe to cook our own food for our dogs. It's really meant to mimic what a dog would eat if they were hunting for themselves out in the wild. The correct proportion of high quality protein, uh, vegetable matter, some calcium, and other proper um, vitamins and minerals and nutrients that would give them balanced nutrition that they need. And this is a mix of uh, ground beef and ground turkey. So we start with about six pounds of, um, of ground meat, turkey, uh, pork, uh, beef of course. And to that we add a mix of about two cups of vegetable matter. Now Maria and I like to use leafy green vegetables, real high in nutrients and antioxidants for your pet. Uh, a lot of colorful vegetables, some peppers, some carrots. Most importantly, we like to use a lot of berries. So Maria is adding two cups approximately of vegetable matter, 
Again, that would mimic what uh, a dog or a wolf would find in the stomach of its prey. Mixing that in there, we like to put the, the juice in as well. A lot of the nutrients are in the juice as well, so we add both the pulp from the vegetables and the juice. You see some blueberry, some raspberry in there, again, very high in antioxidant. In addition to the meat and vegetable mix, we'll add a little bit of egg. Our dogs love eggs. Again, high in quality protein, essential fats. Marie's going to add a little bit of garlic in there. She's a good Italian cook, so uh, she puts this in our food as well as in the food for our dogs. And the garlic is also helpful in uh, ensuring that certain parasites don't bother your pets as well. Good, good to keep the pests away. A little bit of yogurt. When we buy yogurt, we like to look for yogurt that has on the label uh, that it contains live cultures or probiotics. Very good for your dog's digestive tract. So we're going to put about a cup of yogurt in there. And just eyeball it. This does not have to be exact. That's good. Bone meal. Now again, in the wild, your dog would be eating the bones uh, of its prey. So calcium is very, very important. Of course, we like real, raw, meaty bones. But when you don't have the opportunity to do that, bone meal is really good to add into your, your pet's diet as well. So again, for the proportion of mix that we make, we're going to add in about a teaspoon or two of bone meal. good. Kelp. Kelp is excellent for your dogs. Again, aids in digestion, uh, keeps the digestive tract healthy, um, great for infection as well, anti-inflammatory, a lot of uh, benefit to kelp in the dog's food. So again, we're going to put about a teaspoon or two of that. And finally, here you go, Marie, you can put that in, a little bit of apple cider vinegar. And the benefits of apple cider vinegar um, are again they remedy arthritis uh, allergies in your dog um, once again balances the, the digestive tract uh, a lot of benefits to uh, to putting these supplements into your dog's food now when you make your own dog's diet you want to be sure that you are making an informed decision it's important that you find a diet that has the proper balance the right vitamins the right minerals the right nutrients supplementation is important and again, that healthy mix of the correct proportions of quality meats and vegetable and fruit matter. And this is what our final product looks like. Pretty simple. Very easy to make, does not take a lot of time, and your dogs will love it. And as you can see, it's a very easy process. Maria and I spend our Friday nights making dog our food Friday for our night dogs. Date night. <laughs> And this, this uh, particular recipe will last us about a week for our dogs, one which is 75 pounds, American Bulldog, and a small 7-pound miniature pincher. So what we do with this is we measure it out in the correct proportions for a daily uh, meal, uh, and package it up, throw it in the refrigerator, and we've got our dog's meals for the next week. Number three, if people wanted to or had to for whatever their you know, situation is, um, look into processed foods, I actually rank canned diets before kibble. Um, if you can get your dog on a good um, natural ingredient based uh, canned diet, um, which is also meat based, uh, I feel is, is much better um, than going to an all kibble diet right away. If we're adding canned food, basically there are no preservatives in canned food. The canning process is the preserving process. It's only cooked once. However, if kibble uh, happens to be your route that you want to take, that's certainly fine. Uh, it was one of the stepping stones along the way. Uh, for us as well. You know, before we went to Raw, we started going up the scale from one kibble to another. Um, and then ultimately we switched to Raw. Uh, and there's a lot of good kibbles out there today. I have a, a few on display here. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to, there's so many kibbles out there, I'm not going to go through all of them. These are some, some good uh, meat based kibbles, uh, well performing kibbles. Uh, some people even mix some of these with raw food. Uh, and that's something that you want to do with the help of your pet professional or veterinarian. So when you do finally decide to switch, uh, I do have a couple of recommendations. Um, and uh, weaning to a new diet, there's many schools of thought. I'm going to give you mine. And uh, again, this is based on my experience primarily. Uh, because I deal with so many animals transitioning into new diets, uh, 
you know, with the holistic pet shop that I own, uh, I have a lot of success in doing it the way I do it. Okay. Uh, if your if your dog is eating a a, nat, a natural or a kibble based diet, um, you know, the transition is uh, going from kibble to raw, for instance. Uh, I don't recommend weaning. Um, if you're going from a, a natural kibble uh, or any kind of commercial type diet and you want to switch to raw, I do recommend a 24 to 36 hour fast period. Uh, this is allow the, to allow the dog to uh, clean out his digestive tract and prepare his body for his new diet. Um, now the exception to that rule is dogs uh, with medical issues. Okay, some dogs, or depending on the, the breed as well, um, if there's a medical condition or it's a small breed dog, um, you know, you, some dogs just can't uh, fast that long. And again, uh, that's why it's important to, to do this with the help of a pet professional to guide you along the way. Um, for the purpose of this video, um, I do recommend, hey pal, you, you want a chicken neck, huh? Who wants a chicken neck? Come on, up here pal. Sit, good oh boy. That's a good boy. Jake loves his chicken necks. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good. Can lay down now. Um, you know, so if if, uh, if you do decide to switch and fasting is the approach you're going to take, always consider, um, you know, the getting your advice from someone who's been down that road before. I did the 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 quick switch um, because she was just a puppy. Um, I just did it over a couple of days. Basically, she fasted for about 48 hours and then switched her right over to the patties. If you go from one kibble to another, I recommend a weaning period of 13 days. And I break that 13 days down into four 25% segments. Um, so the first set of four days, um, you would take 75% uh, of your old diet and mix it with 25% of your new kibble. Uh, the second set of four days, you mix 50% of each kibble. Uh, the third set of four days you mix 25% of your old kibble and 75% of your new kibble. Uh, and generally on day 13 you're pretty much good to go and the transition is pretty smooth and seamless. Um, some uh, issues that I've experienced uh, in the weaning process from one kibble to another usually occurs in the middle portion, that 50%, 50% segment. When you jump from the 75% to the 50%, there are times you need to pull back a little bit and maybe go 66, 33. Um, you know, depending on your dog and how their stool is and how the transition goes. Um, but that's usually uh, rare. Um, I know I, I give this uh, same uh, recommendation to many owners and they just switch the dog on the fly. Um, I don't recommend that. I do recommend a, a weaning uh, approach as conservative as I laid out. Uh, another option is if you do decide to start implementing cans into the diet, uh, even if you're already on a super premium kibble, uh, you could start adding cans into the diet if you want to transition to an all canned diet. That you could certainly do uh, as slowly as you want. Uh, as you know, whatever makes you comfortable, you can start with as little as a, a teaspoon of canned food and start mixing mixing it in with your kibble. Um, and uh, I, I know a lot of people have great success doing that uh, as slow as they want, uh, and the dogs love it. They love the new moisture, the new meat in their diet, so they take to it pretty easily. Um, so that that's uh, some basic recommendations of weaning to a new food. Uh, now. Some things happen when you wean to a better diet, uh, particularly if you're going to go to a raw diet. Dogs will enter, and I mentioned this earlier talking about Lola, dogs will enter a state of detoxification. During detoxification, many things can happen that are potentially alarming, but are perfectly natural. Once you get through detoxification, and I have a whole list of what to expect after the switch um, on the white papers I have uh, in the DVD for your computer. Um, and there's plenty of great sources out there to uh, describe detoxification and what exactly happens to the pet. Uh, basically what detoxification does is the, the dog is coming into balance. Um, so a lot of things happen. If you're feeding a poor quality diet, um, the toxins are going to be eliminated and they're generally eliminated through the skin. After about two years he started showing signs of uh... Well, you, I guess the uh, hot spots it was called, I didn't know what it was, just like a, irritations where he was missing skin and it was getting bad, where he was biting on it, it was kind of blooded and took him to the vet. They gave me some uh, medication for him, but uh, the medication, uh, it worked for a little while, but didn't take it away. I changed his food, 
uh, you know, went to a uh, meat-based food. His body, his appearance looked a lot better immediately than uh, his skin started getting. It didn't happen overnight, but it happened over, you know, a couple of weeks, over a month, you start seeing the skin start actually, the hair growing back. Once the hair started growing back, then it was just a matter of him just getting really shiny again. And I mean, if you see the picture of him, as you can see on the thing, he's really shiny, you know, got a good coat. His hair is all thick, came back nice, but uh, I think it had a lot to do with the food. That's really, that's the only difference that I did was the food because I gave him the medicine the doctor said to give him. That didn't change him. You know, it was the food was the thing that changed him. The most common symptoms uh, or issues that dogs experience from being fed a lower quality diet is skin and coat problems. Uh, the primary avenue for dogs to expel toxins is through their skin. That's why we see so many skin issues and coat issues with dogs. Um, you know, so uh, those are some of the things that you can expect. Um, and again, always have someone that you can rely on, a pet professional or a veterinarian, to guide you through the process of weaning. Um, so, uh, you know, that being said, we're going to prepare a little meal here, and I'm going to go through some things that, um, and this, the meal I'm preparing is for my other dog, Amber, which you'll meet in a little bit. Um, and uh, Amber just had a uh, knee replacement. She had an anterior cruciate ligament surgery. So uh, she's going to get some extra supplements to help support um, the healing process of that. Before we go on to that, I just want to talk about raw food and the biggest myth associated with feeding a raw diet. The biggest myth associated with feeding a raw diet is the potential for salmonella uh, contamination. My main response is nonsense. Dogs have stomach acids that are so strong, 10 times as strong as ours. And it's not to say that salmonella contamination can't happen. It certainly can. Um, but there are some acids in a dog's stomach and a little process called the digestive process that dogs can tolerate and handle any kind of excessive bacteria that could be present in a food. Certainly 99% of them handle the, the bacteria uh, that are in, that are in uh, raw food. I know a lot of veterinarians will uh, balk at feeding raw diets and will cite salmonella or even E. coli contamination. I personally have never seen a case of salmonella or E. coli, which is a question that comes up when you recommend it. Um, but I personally, being a vet for 12 years, have never seen a case of it myself where I've treated a doggy for salmonella E. coli from the raw, raw foods. So I did some research and uh, I went on uh, the CDC website, Center for Disease Control, and a couple of other websites. And most of the E. coli and salmonella contaminations in the past, I, I think I went back to 2003, they were all processed food products. Um, there were some dog treats, uh, dry dog food, canned dog food, um, even rawhide and pig ears. Uh, there were recalls over the past five years or so. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't find any uh, cited about raw foods. If salmonella is present, the dog's system can handle it. University studies suggest 36% of all healthy dogs um, do carry salmonella in their digestive tract. Uh, that being said, uh, they have the possibility of shedding it in their stool. Um, so and I'm, I'm stating this to uh, it, as a sort of rebuttal to veterinarians who will condemn raw food because of the potential of salmonella um, being transferred or transmitted to humans. Uh, and the uh, primary source of that is an oral route. So if there is salmonella in a food, whether it's raw meat or dog treats or whatever, if the human is eating the infected product, they will probably get salmonella. Um, the other side of the story is that dogs will shed salmonella in their fecal matter. So um, if you happen to eat your dog's poop, you may get salmonella. <laughs> um, so we'll just uh, be careful with that. And anytime you're handling any kind of meat, okay, sanitary practice as you would handle your own. If you're used to dealing with any raw meat as you're cooking, you know, whether it's chicken or beef, you know, you wash your hands, you clean the surfaces in between. Um, and I haven't had any problems at all. Some of these meats are human grade, hormone free, antibiotic free, steroid free. There's some good quality meats out there for our dogs. Okay, so we're going to jump right in. Uh, I'm going to prepare Amber's food and before I do I did want to show you one canned diet here. Uh, this is a company called Evangers. Evangers is an excellent company. They make some nice natural products. Okay, and I'm going to pop open this can to show you what some natural dog foods look like. Okay, and we're we're 
getting a little, we're backpedaling a little here, but this is their chicken thigh formula, okay? And uh, their chicken thighs, when they tell you it's chicken thighs, it's chicken thighs, okay? You got bone and everything in here, and if you see what happens to their bone, it mushes right between your fingers. And if you do decide to, to go to an all-can diet, uh, Evinger's is a great company. Um, they do a lot of natural foods. Uh, they are cooked, um, but uh, their packaging process is nice and clean. Some of their products are kosher for Passover. Uh, this product in particular is one of my favorites. Uh, I use this in, in conjunction with the raw diet. Sometimes, sometimes I forget to defrost their food, so I'll pop open a couple of cans. Um, you know, and I offer it to the dogs as a meal. I give them a, an appropriate serving along with their supplements. And, uh, you know, it's delicious to boot. I mean, you know, you can't go wrong with it. Good stuff. Again, there's a lot of products out there like this. This just happens to be one of, you know, one of my favorites because it is so simple. And, you know, if I can eat it, it's certainly good enough for my dogs. Okay, so I don't want to hear anybody telling me that I shouldn't give my dogs people food. Um, they need to eat more of this. <laughs> so getting back into um, preparing Amber's meal, uh, we're going to just go through real quick. Uh, and it's real simple. And in this here, I have a, a pound of meat. Amber is 50 pounds. Um, and a general rule of thumb is dogs eat between 2 to 3% of their body weight. Um, and this is more for you know, medium to large sized dogs. Some small breeds can eat as much as 5% of their body weight. Uh, puppy rule of thumb is 5 to 10% of their body weight. And again, always consult with your pet professional um, when dealing with nutritional products. Um, those are just some general guidelines for you to base it off of. So uh, already in Amber's bowl, and if you notice, it is stainless steel. Stainless steel or ceramic are far better than plastic. A lot of animals have medical situations that we don't even realize is because they're, they're eating out of bowls that might give them uh, some toxins. I wholeheartedly recommend stainless steel um, regardless of what kind of food that you feed. Um, even with your water and uh, try to use spring water if, if possible. It's much better to give water that doesn't have chlorine in it. And you could use tap water, just let it sit for about 24, 30 hours so it off gases before giving it to your pet. Um, but uh, in Amber's bowl, we already have a couple of chicken necks because they love crunching on these suckers. Jake, you want another one? Sit. <laughs> he loves his chicken necks. Okay, so I'm just gonna scoop this right in. And again, this is a pound of meat and this is all beef based, okay? Um, she gets her enzymes. Uh, this is actually a probiotic and an enzyme formula, okay? Uh, and again, she did just have ACL replacement and reluctantly she was on antibiotics, but you know, major surgery, you know, I followed my veterinarian's advice and uh, put her on a, a, a good antibiotic to prevent infection. Uh, and I just sprinkle this right on the food. Um, real simple. Um, I uh, also supplement with coconut oil. Coconut oil is a great source of lauric acid, okay? Uh, lauric acid is good in fighting yeast, and uh, I do this proactively, and right now Amber's body is imbalanced because of the stress that she's experiencing, the antibiotics destroying all the bacteria in her digestive tract, and she has had uh, yeast infections uh, in the past. Um, and uh, I get her on good amounts of coconut oil, and it fights that can candida right out of her system. Um, we have a couple of supplements here. Uh, these two pills are um, chicken embryo extract. And uh, there's some growth factors in there that's going to help her regenerate some good um, muscle tone and connective tissue, as well as alleviate stress and stabilize cortisol and insulin levels. Um, those two particular cortisol and insulin generally will spike during times of stress. So we're going to regulate those levels. Uh, with this supplement. Uh, here I have uh, B propolis. B propolis is a good immune system support. Um, it's also a natural penicillin. And this I opt to open up the capsule and sprinkle it right on her food. Um, I could pill them too, but I just mix it right in. Uh, next up we have uh, these three pills. Um, these are glandulars and uh, they consist of um, support for the internal organ. They actually come from bovine, uh, which is cow. Uh, bovine internal organs. Um, there's heart, kidney, spleen, uh, liver, uh, pancreas. Um, there's a lot of organs and glands in these three pills and again because she's experiencing stress I just pop those in there to help support her through this time. Um, 
These two pills are this, these are for joint support. This is glucosamine, chondroitin, and MSM, uh, and this is a, a great alternative to the pharmaceutical grade um, joint supplements that are out there um, that are potentially harmful to the liver. Uh, things like Rimadyl, um, uh, prednisone, stuff like that that helps to alleviate pain and reduce inflammation. I can get it done naturally, so uh, that's generally that's what I opt for. Um, here's another product called Pet Recharge, and this is another immune system support supplement, and I just give her a couple of squirts of this. Um, basically a, a one milliliter per 25 pounds, and Amber being 50 pounds, uh, she gets two servings of that, and because I only feed my dogs once a day, this is uh, her meal for the day. Finally, I give her some DMG, dimethylglycine. Uh, dimethylglycine improves circulation in the body and also enhances the immune system. Um, and there's a lot more I could do for her right now, but, uh, and I, I do rotate supplements, and I just kind of mix this up, and, uh, you know, she gobbles this right up, and uh, she's... Uh, She's already getting around um, better than most dogs, uh, I am very, very proud to say. Um, she had surgery 13 days ago, and she's already standing on her hindquarters. And uh, I'd really like to think that that's because of you know, her diet and supplement regimen that I have her on. Whether it's an illness or whether it's a post-op surgery, I, I, I feel that nutrition plays a vital role in, in the healing process of any disease or any surgery. So um, it's critical. So uh, we're getting ready to feed Amber, uh, and you know the dog trainer in me uh, always recommends that you make your dogs earn their resources. Uh, food is generally the number one resource in a dog pack. You definitely want them earning it, okay? Uh, and hopefully Amber won't make a liar of me and she'll cooperate. Come here, come here, Mama. Sit. Girl, stay. 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 Okay. Good girl. <gasps> Daddy's so proud of you. It's a good girl. Just a side note regarding raw food and the possibility of aggression. It is important to understand that feeding raw does not promote aggression. If your dog protects resources, toys, treats, furniture, things along those lines, it is highly likely that your dog will also protect its raw meal. If you're experiencing any resource guarding with the raw food that generally suggests a leadership issue in the household, training is required under those circumstances. You may need to discontinue feeding raw until you get your leadership issues under control. There are a variety of supplements available today in the pet trade. There's numerous reasons why we can supplement um, immune support, joint support, digestive support, skin and coat health, uh, you name it, there's a supplement out there for it. Uh, I use supplements for my dogs and I have dogs of all sizes and ages. Uh, I don't use the same supplements all the time. Um, depending on each individual's need is really how I decide what is best for my animal. Uh, this is what I try to do for clients too. Uh, I, I prefer to, to consult with them, I'll even interview them to decide first and foremost what kind of food is the dog eating. From there, we go on to probe what that pet's specific needs are uh, nutritionally, and then we decide if supplementation is appropriate. Uh, and when you get down to the nitty gritty, uh, you start researching, and it can be quite overwhelming. Um, I choose a, a certain type of supplement for your pet's need, whether it's whole food supplements uh, that you can be sprinkled right over the pet's food, regardless of what kind of diet they're on. Uh, we have joint support issues. My approach has always been that when um, a larger dog, and I consider that 40 pounds and over, becomes um, two years and over, I'll usually start them on some sort of joint care with the glucosamine, chondroitin, vitamin C, MSMs, um, vitamin E, omega-3 and 6 fatty acids. You can use a, a product here as a liquid form. Um, there's some argument out there that a liquid form of joint support is absorbed better into the body. Uh, I use pill form, I use powder form, I also use liquid joint support formulas. I notice efficacy with all products. Um, and I have a 10-year-old pit bull who you would think he's five years old. Uh, and I, I like to think a, a good reason for that is 
his raw feeding and his supplements. Um, you know, and uh, I do rotate my supplements often. Uh, I, I prefer to take the guesswork out and approach my dogs holistically. And what I mean by that is, you know, their overall, the overall screenshot of their diet and supplement regimen. So I rotate often. Um, I allow my dogs to graze naturally in my backyard. If they're grazing a little too long, uh, I might add a whole food supplement that has extra chlorophyll in there. Uh, and lo and behold, they don't graze as much. Uh, so my dogs, they do talk to me. It's important for me as a pet owner to listen to what they're saying. You know, and that's what I'm trying to do here with this video is to help you to be more in tune with your pet. Um, even if your pet is, is older, elderly, and has severe issues, there's a supplement out there for it. You want to improve the quality of life by helping the pet move better, they feel better about themselves, um, by um, not having symptoms such as fever and uh, vomiting and diarrhea. Um, I think, I think animals want to be our companions very much and they want to please us and they want to you know live longer and some hang in there just for us. Um, anything we can do to relieve their discomfort is, is tremendous and um, I think our obligation. Again, it is important to check with your pet professional or veterinarian if your dog does have a disease or a serious condition. Um, it is very easy to over supplement. So it is important, again, to do thorough research and consult with your professionals. And there's ways that you can support the immune system as well, whether the dog is healthy or ailing uh, or has a disease, possibly terminal, you can still support your dog's health through supplementation. Um, in October, Max was diagnosed with lymphoma. And I was told at that point that there was no cure as much as there's a cure for humans. There are no cures for animals when it comes to lymphoma. Unfortunately, he was given only eight months. He gets a lot of herbs. He gets um, a lot of vitamins. Uh, he gets what they call cell advance, which, which helps with the uh, cellular redevelopment. Um, he also gets a lot of omega-3s which are very important. Always do research. Always consult with folks who are nearest to you, who can guide you appropriately uh, before you engage in uh, supplements for your dog's diet. A lot of people are getting very smart about the holistic and dietary management of pets also, and the two work very well together. And I believe that a lot of times with these diseases, most people are wanting to um, Besides just traditional and conventional medication, they're also wanting to use some sort of nutritional or supplementation, um, all natural medications to, to treat most disorders at this time. Another controversial topic nowadays that's becoming increasingly popular in debate is that of vaccines. Uh, vaccines is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Back in 2004, we lost one of our dogs to vaccinosis. Uh, vaccinosis is a disease uh, from vaccines. Uh, you could do more research on that yourself. Adam was our dog's name uh, and he, uh, he died about 30 days after he got a combination vaccine. Now I'm sure he's one of the extreme cases. It is very sad to see what happens with, with vaccines and you probably experience more of the acute response to vaccines because they it can cause a, an allergic response and it can cause actual organ failure. He certainly was a catalyst in furthering our natural rearing of our, our current dogs. Um, we, uh, we no longer vaccinate yearly. Uh, we opt to do titers. We're moving away from yearly vaccines. Uh, most of our clients are also running titers when it's allowed. There are certainly many conservative vaccine protocols out there. Uh, I know one common protocol is to uh, vaccinate puppies uh, through a recommended schedule and then revaccinate at one year of age. University of Wisconsin published a study that annual revaccination is not required and that the antibodies potentially last for the life of the pet. In fact, it's possible 
and I do advocate this, that if you give a rabies vaccine at six months old, you're probably protected for life. And again, this is something that you really need to discuss with your veterinarian to determine what is best for you. Uh, when it comes to vaccines and flea and tick medications, uh, I personally choose not to use chemicals on my dogs. One of the very, very important principles of, of alternative medicine, and I think it should be a, of all veterinary doctors, is to try to minimize the amount of toxins in our, our uh, patients' bodies. And as far as flea and tick medications go, I do not give my pets uh, pesticides anymore or any kind of chemicals, especially when they say on the box not to come in direct contact with my skin, yet I'm going to put it on my dogs. The alternative is to use essential oils from, from herbs. Uh, there are a lot of essential oils and there are a lot of um, companies out there that make them, so I'm not going to mention specific oils other than neem and EEM, which is a common one in, in a lot of them. In addition to their healthy diet, uh, my pets are not desirable hosts for parasites because they're healthy. Uh, and I do use the natural products which keeps bugs, insects, mosquitoes, uh, keeps them off my dogs. Now, if you're in a heavily wooded area or a, a high tick area, certainly consult a pet professional uh, because ticks are very resilient. You have to get the right product that's also going to repel ticks besides fleas and mosquitoes. Fleas and mosquitoes are much easier to repel. Ticks require stronger essential oils. So you might need to implement some course of preventative on your animal if you're in that type of region. Well, now that we've learned some do's and don'ts about how to naturally and holistically care for our pets, uh, I like to approach this last segment uh, and refer to it as relationship. Uh, and relationship, uh, I see three uh, common areas where we can really improve our relationship with our, our uh, companions. Okay, we have uh, grooming, exercise, and training. Uh, grooming, on one hand, helps dogs eliminate toxins. It also keeps them clean, and who doesn't like to feel clean? Um, whether you have a short-haired dog or a long-haired dog, uh, a curly-haired dog or a hairless dog, uh, all dogs benefit from grooming, massage, exercise, training, uh, and it really promotes a healthy relationship between us and our companions. Brush the animal's coat. Okay, and when I'm talking about that, the coat, I mean the skin, using a slicker brush. So if it's a thick-haired dog, like a German Shepherd or, or a, a Retriever type of coat, you use a, a regular slicker brush. And if it's a thinner coat, you'd use a soft slicker brush, a gentle slicker brush. And the bent wires are very helpful in actually massaging the coat and, and releasing toxins from that subcutaneous layer. Uh, there's many, many grooming tools out on the market today. Uh, the one I choose for my dogs um, is uh, something called the Love Glove, and it works really well for short-haired dogs. And we also have the Shih Tzus. The Shih Tzus have a multitude of tools to use. Bettis, come. He's a good boy. Oh, he's a good boy. Good boy. Come here, pal. And I'm righty, and so luckily the Love Glove is righty. <laughs> And the thing I like about the Love Glove with short-haired dogs, it really gets a good topical brush down the dog, and you can really dig deep back and forth. Right now, we're in springtime here in the Northeast, so our dogs are blowing their winter coat, and they're shedding a little extra right now. So those of you who don't think pit bulls shed or pit bull mixes shed, think again. But they really love a good groom, and they also get into the habit of massaging my dogs. Massaging is very important for relationship. Um, it does help eliminate toxins. And because these guys are athletes, they're running around an awful lot. Um, so I, I try to massage them almost every day. Another useful tool I like to use, I shouldn't say tool, but uh, procedure, uh, my good friend Dr. Bukoff always recommends to thump the thymus. Thump the thymus every day. And with us, we do it right between the the armpits, but for our pets it's just a little bit lower down in between their front legs. 
and uh, right on the, on the sternum, just five or ten taps just once a day will help to keep the immune system a little bit more revved up and functioning more properly uh, for the animal's benefit. And that's just right here in the chest cavity. Um, and this uh, initiates an immune response, the thymus gland, and really does wonders. And because I care for my dogs naturally, um, I try to take as many suggestions as possible. Um, and uh, as far as uh, exercise and training goes, I try to approach those hand in hand. So Greg, you've been training for about five years now. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the correlation between uh, exercise and behavior? Uh, yeah, you, we've all heard the adage, a tired dog is a good dog. And uh, there absolutely is a correlation between your dog's physical exhaustion and having a well-behaved dog. So, um, you know, walking the dog, uh, exercising the dog, playing with the dog are all important to keeping your dog exhausted, calm, and well-behaved. We find that just as important as physical stimulation or exercise is mental stimulation, keeping your brains, uh, your dog's brain exercised as well. So again, if you're training the dog properly and creating what we call a thinking dog, uh, you'll find your dog is much better behaved, much more calm, much more focused, less stressed out. So yeah, exercise, both physical and mental stimulation, extremely important to behavior. I do have daily sessions with my dogs. Um, I really try though to promote uh, resource control with my dogs. When implementing resource control, I try to make my dogs earn all of their resources. Food, treats, toys, affection, playtime. These are all resources that it is important to make your dog earn through obedience commands. Quite simply, before you feed your dog, you make them sit. Before you take them out or put their leash on, you make them sit. If you're playing with them and you're having an exercise and play session, implement obedience during that session. Make your dog earn all of its resources. There's a general rule of thumb to follow. Either your dog is working for you or you're working for your dog. And we all want our dogs working for us. You saw earlier, uh, before Amber was, uh, was uh, given her food, she had to earn the privilege of eating. Me as the pack leader, and I'm a proponent of pack hierarchy, I try to promote and instill in my dogs that they have to earn resources that are important to them. Uh, pretty much all resources for that matter. Uh, so I try, to, I try to integrate training and exercise together. Betis! Go! Sit. Stay. Stay. Good stay. Good boy. Sit. Speak. Good boy. And a little love between runs goes a long way as he catches his breath a little bit. But this guy's just warming up. You want all the toys. Sit. Good, sit. Stay. Stay. Good boy. So the link between exercise and training, uh, I think, is uh, one of the best ways to improve our relationship with our dogs. We get them working while they're exercising. You kill two birds with one stone. I recommend uh, an exercise regimen uh, at least two or three times daily. Um, and I do that with all of my dogs. <laughs> this guy's just raring to go. Uh, I try to get at least a... Uh, two sessions in, three sessions in a day, and they're usually about 30 seconds to a minute long. Real quick hits, just to keep my dogs working for me all the time. And then of course, they earn all their resources. Uh, people always ask me what kind of tricks do I teach my dogs. And uh, I guess my biggest claim to fame is I have three dominant pit bulls and they all get along. So we just saw a brief overview of uh, how to improve the relationship with our pets. I wanted to take a minute here to really stress the importance of walking our dogs on a daily basis. This does not constitute exercise. Daily walks should be in addition to exercise. Walking with your dog satisfies certain exploratory instincts that our domestic dog still has within. So walking your dog every day is very important and crucial 
to building and maintaining a good relationship. You know, as an 11 year old dog, he's not going to be able to take, you know, the rigorous hikes that he would take as a five year old dog, but he still takes good hikes and he still needs to take good hikes. Mm. And if I just stop doing that, I'm sure that his, his, um, his muscles and joints would start seizing up and failing. And, you know, so I can't ever stop doing that, no matter how tired I am at the end of the day. <laughs> yep. I still must take my hike with my dog. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's a wonderful thing and I love it too. It's good for my holistic care as well. So keep that in mind. Anytime it's a little chilly out or maybe it's a little too hot out, just remember our dogs can certainly benefit from a good walk. Well, we've come to the end of our journey together. And I've shared some thoughts, experiences, and opinions with all of you. You've witnessed first-hand accounts from actual pet owners, saw clips from veterinarians, and hopefully learned a little bit more about holistic pet care. I offered some do's and don'ts, and I illustrated specifically how to feed our dogs, highlighted how we can groom and train and exercise our companions. And here at the end of our road, we have Bettis gnawing on his tendon. And he's about as happy as can be. He had a full day. That's what it's all about, really, is enjoying each day with our pets. Unfortunately, their time with us is often too short. Hopefully, this video empowers you to make that time together just a little longer.